in this episode of Vika Studio with Naveen Nakhvi. We are a mass brand. So a mass brand has to continue to be relevant to the emerging population, not the uh, you know aging population. Your competence only takes you forward till a certain level and past that there is more than just competence that is required for uh, leadership roles. Women also do well on merit. They should be there for reasons other than tokenism, other than checking a box. There is unstability globally happening, mm. but things are easing, prices are falling, in global interest rates are easing. I feel that um, we need to give a little bit of an, a chance to this country. I'm still optimistic about Pakistan, that's why you see me here. Hello and welcome to VCAST Studio with Naveen Nakhvi. Today we have with us Mehvish Valiani, the CEO of Al Karam Studio. Mehvish has been in the corporate sector for over two decades, where she started off in the field of investment banking and was one of the leaders in that field as a woman until she made the shift to fashion. So let's talk to Mehvish and find out more about her journey. Welcome. How are you? I'm all well. Thank you so much for having me, Naveen. Let's start from the very beginning, Mevish. Um, let's start from your time at IBA. What did you uh, learn about life during your time there? Well, uh, made uh, a lot of friends, um, had a lot of fun, um, learned to study a little over there as well. So was not one of the nerdiest in my batch. Um, however, one thing that I learned after exiting IBA was that we weren't taught enough to make it in the practical world and that's something I feel that perhaps our business schools or grad undergrad schools need to really look into how to prepare our students more thoroughly to make it into the practical world. So do you think that there is some kind of knowledge that can only be gained through experience in fact I mean it doesn't matter which uh, institute it might be or perhaps perhaps and uh, in fact uh, you know peppering um, you know internship experiences and uh, you know complementing that with the studies but perhaps one internship would not be enough I, I would imagine that you know in in a span of a year I think one should seek multiple internships because it prepares you better for uh, you know the professional world and what you'd like to do depending on you know what the aspirations uh, of that particular student is for us at that point was to get employed Right? right today it may be many many other aspirations people may want to be entrepreneurial their own businesses which may not necessarily uh, require them to have the same kind of zeal for internships right so you said that that was the first uh, box that was ticked mm -hmm. so which means that you wanted to be in that world of uh, business administration no absolutely because at at our in, during our times that was the place to be, either that or lumps. So um, me being a Karachiite, you know, for me that was the place to get to. And once I got in, it was it was definitely that checkbox. But you already in. had that career path planned from the beginning. Correct. Correct. Okay. So uh, that's great that you found the trajectory, and in that trajectory, you started off first with UBL. So can you tell us about your experience there? Um, so UBL was actually my second job. I started off with a credit rating agency assignment. Uh, it was called JCR VIS at that point. Now I think it's called VIS. Um, again, a very, very intense experience and uh, learned a lot and also understood a lot about how companies operate and how to analyze them. And uh, UBL became a very natural extension and it became my launch pad into in turn, uh, into the investment banking world, which I'm very grateful for that experience. Um, had a lot of fun, made a lot of friends, worked on some really iconic deals there as well. How did it do that? How did it prepare you and, and thrust you into the world of banking? Um, so UBL was one of the um, largest investment banks when I joined UBL. And all the deals that needed to happen, UBL had to be part of it. So when you are working with that kind of an institution, 
you get exposed to all the core key deals that are happening in the market and you get to learn tremendously as a, as a result of that. So, you know, those, those years were very rich in experience in those terms. And, you know, it also um, made, made me understand what are the key big, big transactions that Pakistan's economy right now is bringing into the fold. And, uh, yeah, so as a, as a young learner, it was a lot. It was a lot of rich experience. And how has a career in finance uh, influenced your perspective and your practice as a, as a business professional? I think uh, we don't realize when we are uh, doing something every day, we take it for granted. It's only when uh, you land in a place where um, those practices are not there, when, where you feel that, oh, I took these skill sets for granted, but they are considered important and uh, there is a gap here, but I possess those skills because of what I've learned for a good part of my career, which I kind of took for granted. Hmm. So uh, case in point is when I came into the fashion world and uh, fashion world clearly you know people are uh, people have their soft skills, the creative side, um, there is this hardcore supply chain side. However the number side is number skill is a very rare skill and this is something I realized that you know I'm one of the few who would understand the numbers and that made me realize that okay so this is something I have to give back to the sector right this is where uh, you know understanding of data or um, putting numbers at front and center of your decision making model uh, can come through and so that's that was something uh, very interesting let's talk about your move to uh, fashion um, what in particular about Al Karan Studio was appealing to you that you made that shift? I think it was a, it was a few, um, but it, the most compelling one, if I would uh, say, Naveen, would be the business transformation story that was waiting to happen. Um, when uh, you know a name that is so that was considered so big, so huge historically, you know. All of us grew up thinking about Alkaram as synonymous with lawn. Mm. Um, but when you, when, when I was asked in my induction interviews about how much I knew about Alkaram, I had to, uh, you know, excuse myself because I was not a shopper at Alkaram, and uh, that pushed me to ask myself, why am I not shopping at Alkaram? What is missing here? Which does not attract people like me or even younger lot to come to Alkaram. And that particular bit uh, threw a challenge my way that, okay, so then here is the gap and the gap presents an opportunity. And uh, wherever there is an opportunity is your place to perform. So was it you who identified that gap and decided to uh, 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 bridge that? I'm sure it was mutual. Okay, so, but you have led it, would you say? I have been blessed with a very, very smart and a very dedicated set of leadership team um, that really, really um, ran alongside me because we were, we've been literally running for the last 30 or so months since I joined this place and we're still running by the way. So, and uh, happily running, um, there's, there's no respite in this sector. But I wouldn't take all the credit myself. It's it's a, a big part of it is the team um, that helps make it all happen. And I would give a lot of credit to the board and sponsors of Alkaram who have been anything but supportive. They've not just been cheering us on, they have been lending every kind of support that is needed. Um, and it's very rare to see sponsors do that with a professional management in place. So, that is also something very unique about Alkaram. Um, retail fashion is predominantly run by owners, business owners. Mm. And this is one of the few fashion brands or perhaps maybe one, or one of the one or two brands that is run purely by professional management. And sponsors and board are just at, there to guide and govern. With the brand refresh and the new logo and the new aesthetic, there seems to be a move towards appealing to the younger uh, clientele. Absolutely. 
Okay, so the younger consumer that you're thinking of is Gen Z? Mostly, and also a few of younger millennials. What kind of changes are you making? Can you tell us about that? So Naveen, uh, I think around the same time last year, this time around, we, um, we, we commenced a research on uh, you know, what, what, do the, what does this younger generation want and why are we not relevant to the younger generation. Um, and that's something I told you even when I was being inducted and asked yeah. if I did shop at Alkaram. And so the biggest um, challenge that Alkaram fa faced or still continues to face to a smaller extent now is attracting a younger generation and appealing to them or relating to them. So the research, the premise of the research was to understand what do the younger masses want. We are a mass brand. So a mass brand has to continue to be relevant to the emerging population, not yes. the uh, you know aging population. So um, very interesting things uh, came out and they were verbatims that were taken from uh, interviews that we, uh, you know, our uh, research agency, o um, uh, ULA, conducted the research. And uh, very interesting verbatims came out of it. And uh, once we started listening to those voices, um, a big message that came out of it was that we don't find Alkaram's clothing comfortable. We would like to seek comfort out of whatever we wear in general also. And uh, look, each one of these brands have uh, found their own niche. Some brands are, you know, national, some brands are international, traditional. They, they all have their own appeal and uh, they kind of play by the, that playbook. Right. Um, ours was an appeal that was really, really resonating with a particular age group. And so we decided to pick comfort as the message that we would like to give through our products. Okay. And uh, after choosing that, now once you've picked that message, you also need to deliver on it. Yes. So that's a journey we have decided to undertake. I wouldn't say that we are 100% there, but what started happening as a result that, okay, comfort is the space you want to get into. What, do, what should comfort mean? Comfort should mean comfort to belong into any particular, uh, to be accepted. Body as, as you are, and well, inclusivity. body positivity is one aspect of it. Um, age fluidity is another aspect of it. Um, you know, as you go through your day, your various phases of the day, or uh, your um, social orientation, uh, whether you are somebody who takes a hijab, or whether you are somebody who would like to wear Western outfits or fusion outfits, mm -hmm. is Alkaram the place that is, uh, you know, that, that is giving you all of those things? Um, and so started our journey, um, we started uh, looking for the cues that we could give through our products and a big part of our product is unstitched so, and then there is pret. So the journey resulted in two immediate things for us, we, um, created, we started creating, so fabric also came out as another thing that people identify us with, that Alkaram and fabric. Alkaram is known for its fabric, Alkaram's legacy is fabric, Alkaram understands fabric. Hmm. These are the three things people accept that you know this brand, this is a generational brand, it does that. Now, Right now we have our third generation sponsor taking over. So um, taking that fabric story forward, we felt that we need to demonstrate the functionality of fabric. What a single piece of fabric can do it can be designed in multiple silhouettes that silhouette sure. can um, fit a curvy woman it could fit a lean woman mm -hmm. it could it could also be very comfortable for a hijabi woman or it could also be styled by a young progressive girl who's going to college so immediately um, what we uh, designed was um, four or five ways styling of our pret collections and uh, you know even if when you get into our stores now you will see our hotspots wearing uh, all these mannequins wearing three to four um, fabrics that we would that would be created in four, at least four to five silhouettes there would be a jacket there could be uh, you know a loose dress there could be culottes there could be a short top so you know 
you can mix and match so the comfort another interpretation of comfort is also mixing and matching as per your desire as per your comfort level right um so that was one uh, play at uh, comfort that we did which was fabric functionality the second bit that we did and uh, you know that too was the outcome of our study done by ula was that 70% of your apparel sales 70% yes that's a huge it's sum it's still fabric it's still loose fabric right so the pret market that you see is mostly an urban phenomenon and there's a huge population residing in rural areas which is a younger population that is still buying fabric and that and is having still it having it tailored right so are you creating that kind of a fabric that younger generation is able to relate to hmm. so we started also focusing on design themes what is new what is trending what looks cleaner what looks less cluttered and so our design team also got to work and we we've started putting in those capsule collections every month to experiment what is the audience liking what is what so the audience was liking cleaner uh, yes fabric okay. and it's primarily targeted towards younger audiences who we feel re- resides in tier 2 cities or rural oriented cities who are still buying fabric but they are younger they perhaps may not want the prints that the aging generation wants so these experiments also started working out so uh, ever since may so it's been 4 months 4 5 months and our pret functional fabric uh, the hot um, you know our uh, rebranding collection that's what we call it so each month there are about three fabrics styled four five ways so about 15 pieces reach our stores and they stock out in a matter of days and uh, same is the case with our uh, unstitched collections you know the experiments we started doing they have been very well appreciated and welcomed uh, now right right now we don't know if it's the younger audience that's buying it or the older ones but that it's been very uh, warmly welcomed by our customers what about export is that something that alkaram studio is interested in yes we see it as a huge opportunity and uh, we we are very keen to pursue it right now we have about 4 to 5% of our uh, top line uh, coming from international sales online international sales so uh, we would definitely like to grow that and uh, we definitely like to understand how far um, this demand takes us So initial uh, immediate focus is on growing international online sales and uh, mid term plans are to uh, you know sort of extend that into a brick and mortar affair how much of a part does technology play in the work that you do a big part um, especially in terms of uh, real time getting real time data and uh, understanding sell through through stats that plays a huge role in demand planning what you will produce for the next season has a big part of that role is played through your uh, current sales data um yes uh, the game can be deepened by uh, you know um, using technology to uh, extend it to warehouse management um we are right now in uh, the phase of uh, executing omni channel because we do feel that omni channel also has a big role to play in efficient inventory management mm-hmm. so that's one thing we're pursuing uh, but i think there is no limit to technology um ai can play a big role in helping you with designs and uh, aut- you know automating a lot of other functions but pakistan's a little um, behind behind and there is, it, we 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 need some more time to get to that place right what can you tell us about your leadership style up until i was in banking or financial sector i knew what i was doing that's that's the knowledge i grew up with so therein things were um, things came very naturally to me because all the roles that i got were competence based or were based on the fact that i would be able to lend my um, uh, technical knowledge now here i am in an industry where i have not really been raised in and i am uh, i have a team full of people reporting into me who at any given point in time would know more about this field than i ever would mm. um in a few for a few years so there uh, my role has now completely changed here you know the role uh, goes beyond uh, technical uh, technical guidance right that's not something they need 
what they need is uh, perhaps some of the values that I've learned in the, you know, by working in structured spaces. Retail is a very unstructured kind of an industry. So uh, perhaps a bit of, um, you know, learning about how to form processes, follow processes so that, because a lot of work in retail is also a repeat fashion work. Yes, of course. Right? So um, if it's done in an ad hoc manner, um, you kind of lose your efficiency. So being more process oriented, being more data driven, uh, being uh, more focused on uh, driving uh, objective results, right? So those are some of the values that uh, I felt I could transfer right. to the company, to the workforce. Um, again, uh, in terms of uh, management style, uh, my management style is very hands on. Um, I'm not somebody who likes to sit back and uh, delegate. You know, uh, no, delegation is one matter, but I am not okay with uh, without knowing where where things are at. So um, I think that kind of helped here as well because sometimes what I feel is the workforce definitely needs guidance. They could be lost in the midst, and if I'm if I'm around to ask them is there anything I can do to clear that their path that's where I felt that you know that uh, level of uh, being involved has helped. What kind of team building exercises do you uh, uh, employ? So um, I think most of the team building or the best way to build a team in my opinion yes. my humble opinion is through uh, joint shared tasks you are going to have the most naturally um, cohesive team when people are given a particular task or a challenge to tackle together mm. and uh, if cross-functionally people are working to tackle that challenge a they are learning how to work with each other mm -hmm. um, how different they are from each other and you know for a place for a for a for an employer like Alkaram we have blue collared workforce as well sure. that is working alongside very white collar very uh, top of the line sophisticated people as well and for these kind of two poles to come and work alongside each other takes a lot of lessons in tolerance um, in respecting the knowledge that the other person brings to the table and uh, so, so I think a big part of my day goes into teaching that to my team to be tolerant to be accepting to be inclusive these values are so much more needed in a company like Alkaram where the workforce is so diverse tell us about um, in every uh, you know sort of line of work there is conflict how do you navigate the conflicts that uh, present themselves to you conflicts usually uh, happen when you are placing yourself ahead of the task and uh, if the task, if the commonality of goal is established and if you are able to have a convergence of everybody's intentions towards achieving the goal, then perhaps a lot of differences can be put aside and usually it is the, it is the, it is the job of the supervisor or the manager or the leader mm -hmm. to uh, you know uh, to to basically convince convince the team around that you have a common goal to pursue. In our case, the goal is very simple: to get our stuff into stores on time. Mm -hmm. And usually, a lot of uh, uh, conflicts arise out of that. It's his job. It's her job, not mine. Um, and clearly, you know, in a bureaucratic organization or in a in a public sector setup that's okay hmm. but if in a private sector organization and a fast fashion retail organization this kind of behavior cannot cannot make the brand last for too long right. you will you will drop balls you will uh, miss collection deadlines there's a lot of uh, there's a lot a lot at stake hmm. and so i think my job constantly is to explain that and get everybody's buy-in into agreeing that that common goal has to be pursued above everything. Um, I think 
that's that's how I resolve conflicts. What was the hardest lesson you've learned, Mevish, along the way? I would say that the hardest lesson that I learned was that your competence only takes you forward till a certain level and past that there is more than just competence that is required for uh, leadership roles and uh, and that's I think again it all depends on the kind of ambition one has and as somebody who's always um, who's always believed in the fact that there should be no barriers regardless of your gender or your age if you feel that you have it in you then you should be given that opportunity and so that hard lesson was learnt when I realized that it takes more than just competence to go beyond a certain level and uh, what are those lessons some of those lessons that uh, you know I have understood and absorbed um, some of them may I may not agree with but some of them I have embraced um, I think how well you can manage your stakeholders upwards as well as downwards so that's a big one big lesson that I um, have learned and uh, what do you bring to the table beyond your competence right um, a lot of times Naveen there are assignments that are considered hard or nearly impossible hmm. and uh, people might say that those may make or break your career so the break bit prevents a good deal of us to take on those opportunities those assignments hmm. and uh, they can be potential opportunities but they can only be opportunities until they cannot be recognized until you step into them and tackle them right so uh, for me um, that bit was a big learning that if certain things require taking on a challenge hmm. to get into a leadership opportunity then perhaps those are the kind of uh, uh, learnings you need to embrace and how do you how do you make an opportunity out of a challenge right and okay. my last cup my last three assignments have been pretty much along those lines whether it was taking on the role for heading investment banking at Alphala or in Frizamin uh, chief investment officer yeah. or now recently this company for the last three years. What is one um, guiding principle that you have maintained throughout your career? I always believe in taking risks. Sometimes uh, I think the, the risks also have not been uh, sometimes they've paid off sometimes they have really backfired I mean it's not an easy choice it's it's something uh, it's a default setting of mine yeah. right so uh, so hence you know it it becomes your guiding principle so one is risk taking the second bit is um, I may not be the most talented person so which is why it brings me to your first statement when you said you're one of the most yes the leading leading and uh, I would say I'm not the smartest person in a room, but you will find me as the most uh, persistent person in the room. I don't like giving up. I would want to make sure that I have kind of explored our options before I raise my hands. Um, so I'm very persistent and, um, and I feel that that's the right attitude that gets you through things rather. So, so I don't think I need to be the smartest person in the room, mm. but I am the hardest working person in the room and probably the most persistent person um, so I it's hard for um, negative circumstances to bring me down it takes a lot to bring me down I think those two three principles have really helped me out in my career on the board uh, governance governance level what are some of the policies which uh, if implemented can create uh, change in the culture of an organization where, where I've seen boards becoming very effective um, is where you know uh, when boards possess those kind of skill sets that the organization in that particular stage of the, its life needs guidance in you know needs the needs guidance for the most mm -hmm. and uh, for instance you know when you know so we have an advisory board and uh, we have somebody on the board um, who, is, who was uh, the marketing brains behind Coke Studio. 
and uh, you know they have helped us um, get on our uh, repositioning or rebranding bandwagon. They, he was here, there to guide us throughout. So because that's what the brand needed at that point, so we got somebody like that on our board. Uh, we also have someone who um, is. I mean, they'd uh, be able to tell you what the younger lot would like, right? Exactly. Or they they were able to get us the right counsel, the right kind of um, advisors yeah. uh, around to uh, guide us through that process. And I think uh, you know uh, the results you have seen yourself as sure. well. The other need that we felt was um, you know digital transformation. So we have somebody on our board. Who is uh, who's responsible for that? For overseeing that mm -hmm. for us? Um, again, you know, audit and HR tend to be the traditional forms of governance that we do, and we have somebody for, to look after for that as well. So, typically, you know, whatever guidance the organization needs, and if you have those skill sets on the board, people usually have a lawyer sitting on the board as well. People usually have, um, you know, a chartered accountant. You know, sometimes an IT expert for digitalization. Um, I saw that for some particular bank, and uh, today many banks who are have digital aspirations have digital experts or IT experts sitting on the board as well. So I feel it's a function of what an organization needs beyond the regulatory governance as well. Yeah. That's where the board can be the most effective. Right. What would your advice be to men who enter the workforce about how they should respond to and should be towards the women that they work with. Men today are much more woke, younger men, yes. than uh, you know the the generation you know you and I might have had to face okay. when we entered workforce. Um, I would like to kind of take the liberty of you know sort of adding some more stuff to your uh, question because your question is such a leading question. I think um, I would like to take this beyond just men entering workforce i would like to for the entire workforce to understand what is it because every every day when we are when somebody is starting their career the eventual aim is to get to somewhere on the leadership path right right um, so i think let's let's try and understand what leadership means or what leadership meant when you and i were entering workforce um, it was a very masculine definition, yes. right? Or even if a woman had to be um, a leader, she had to possess certain masculine traits, traits to be traits, and they may not exactly be gender related traits, but they were associated with being a male leader. And I wouldn't blame anybody at that point because all you saw was male leaders because you only had men working. So if you have a male workforce, you will only have a male leader, right? right? You do not have those examples set in. But let's take a step back and to the younger workforce, I would like to say is that try and understand what the role of a leader entails. Mm -hmm. Should it be those gender based norms, things that we grew up seeing that, oh, you know what? You shouldn't be able to shed a tear. You should be tough. You should be, uh, you know, you should have a demeanor of steel. Yes. Is that what it takes to be really a leader? Mm. I, I feel the leadership values need to be really defined for the young workforce. And to me, those are the few of the values that I would like to share. Or those are things that, you know, I'm trying to unlearn the older values, let's just put it that way. Yeah. And the newer values that I'm trying to imbibe in myself also are empathy. A culture of performance, accountability, um, merit-driven culture, mm -hmm. and uh, there is no shame in shedding a tear. It's okay, mm. but deliver results. We are here to look after you. We are here to create an enabling environment for you. That's what a leader does. Mm -hmm. a leader is not just tough. A leader is the one who helps you create a workspace that that makes you want to deliver, that motivates you to come to workplace every day and deliver results. Hmm. I feel long and short a leader should be that. Right. And that's, those are the kind of values I would want the younger generation to look towards and not attach the role of a leader to a particular gender related traits. 
Um, second bit that I would like to um, say, and that's that again, those those values start with how you raise your kids also. So you know, as mothers, if you know the mothers are listening, fathers are listening. You know, please raise your kids to be more tolerant of each other. Yeah. To be more empathetic of each other and to understand what really drives results. Is it is it being bossy? Is it being uh, you know, or is it is it is it some other things that count? Like having a collaborative spirit, for instance. More inclusivity. More inclusive. And also to believe in merit. Yeah. Um, and finally, um, to to the to the women workforce. Please do not accept roles being offered to you in, uh, you know, in the shape of tokenism. Mm. Women should not be in places of power and authority because they had to check a box. Mm -hmm. For instance, boards where women are just being right, left and center inducted yes. because you have to fill a seat, you have to fill a woman's seat. Well, obviously, women on board, uh, it, it had to happen in some way. Yeah. But I feel that even on boards, women should be, uh, you know, we, women should be welcomed on boards for reasons more than just their gender. Yes. For the value that they can add, for the experience that they carry. Right. So they shouldn't just be a check on the box. And uh, same goes for where, where, where you're talking about political positions or your multilaterals. A lot of stuff is being done under in, in the spirit of tokenism um, while it's all good because you have to create equality and a lot of argument is made from the other side in favor of this as well because there isn't any presence of women so it is necessary to create it. However, we shouldn't forget that women also do well on merit. They should be there for reasons other than tokenism, other than checking a box. As we're wrapping up our conversation. You live and work here. These are difficult times for Pakistan. What drives your personal optimism for this country? A number of factors. Um, I see a lot of uh, entrepreneurship happening around me. And particularly in the last four or five years, I have seen uh, you know, it blossoming against all odds. Hmm. Um, that's very encouraging, especially to see so many young entrepreneurs out there. Um, we, growing up, never thought we'd be entrepreneurs. And being entrepreneurial also, the mindset. Um, a lot I've learned in the last three years also, the, what an entrepreneurial mindset entails. And it may not just be about you pursuing your own business. It's about how you operate, right? Mm. And so I, I feel very um, optimistic when I see that spirit of entrepreneurial mindset hmm. uh, amongst the youth. So that is one encouraging thing. The second bit is uh, the fact that about 45 to 50 percent of your workforce falls between the ages of 18 and 40. That is such a tremendous opportunity for a com country that may not have much export prospects hmm. but in terms of labor if you are if you can upskill this particular age group yes you do not necessarily need to send them to universities or schools but you may you know technically upskill this labor force hmm. and it is ready to serve and earn huge foreign exchange for the com uh, country so i i still see i still believe in the labor force potential yeah. to contribute and especially the fact that big part of it is so young yes which means there is hope with youth there is hope there is more optimism yes and the third bit is the still under huge under representation of women um, when I go to schools even today 80% of the moms more educated than, than me in some cases doctors PhDs are stay-at-home moms um, again, what I feel is that while I hope that that's just an elitist thing, but the fact that such a big population of and such a such a potential contributor is sitting at home, if doing they, an unpaid labor, doing unpaid labor, yeah. a very valuable one though, but uh, unpaid, right? Yeah. 
right they too have the potential to contribute so much to this economy in unconventional ways you don't need to put them in conventional employment situations yeah so that too uh, i feel is a huge opportunity um, as far as we as a country are concerned so those 1.9 million pakistanis who've left us good luck to them i hope good things happen for them <laughs> however what ever is left here mm. to the pakistanis i would say that they they have left you with so many potential vacancies opportunities this country has so much more to offer um there is instability globally happening mm. but things are easing prices are falling in global interest rates are easing i feel that um, we need to give a little bit of an a chance to this country i'm still optimistic about pakistan that's why you see me here i couldn't be happier to be back i have to say um so uh, on a lighter note uh, tell us what you're wearing are we getting a sneak peek into what's coming to alkaram studio so i'm wearing uh, alkaram's fall winter collection mm -hmm. 2024 um it hits stores from um, monday yeah. and so you know you can uh, you can go shop till you drop and um, i am particularly fond of this color and uh, this piece this was this was created uh, by my design team and uh, with a lot of love and the other bit that exciting bit um, that i'd like to share is that about uh, 30 40 pieces just like this design are created in two fabrics this is something this is a first for the industry we've created this design in cambric for the warmer areas of pakistan uh huh to cater to you know geographic climate uh, climate uh, you know nuances and khadar for our um, you know central and northern population so we've tried to be a little different we've try we try and bring some firsts to the industry as well um that's how we try and show our customers that we care and we are thinking about them we are listening to their feedback that's wonderful thank you so much for joining us on vika studio Uh, it was a real pleasure to talk with you. Thank you, Naveen. Thanks so much for watching this episode. We'll see you soon with more. And uh, if you like this episode, leave a comment.